So let's move on to the next uh, topic which is transfer of experience points from other players. And here I would love to add that I remember when playing World of Warcraft some time ago, uh, it was so important that when, I, when we had our guild, that the more experienced players were sharing their, uh, their insights with the new members of the guild. So in a similar way, it's so great that we have amazing companies joining us here today. To, to share their experience on how uh, to handle intellectual property as game developers. And the first uh, presentation would be from uh, Daria Firsava from Wargaming, the second presentation from Monika uh, Gebel from People Can Fly, and then we'll walk, welcome back Christina. Uh, Daria, are you with us? Hello, hello, yes. Yes, perfect. Uh, I hear you, uh, and we don't see you yet. Now we see you. Great. Welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I am more than excited to be speaking to all of you. Thank you very much for inviting. And uh, yeah, uh, because I'm Intellectual Property Council, I also have a tremendous respect to uh, wiper. <laughs> so yeah, guys, I'm so sad I'm not with you today. So uh, my name is Daria Firsova. I'm the head of the intellectual property department at Wargaming. Uh, Wargaming has been uh, on the market for many years already, and I'm sorry for some reason I cannot proceed with my slides. Yeah, here we go. So we have a huge experience with intellectual property at Wargaming. Uh, our three biggest titles are World of Tanks, World of Warships, World of Tanks Blitz. And World of Tanks has been uh, one of the top 10 MMO video games for the last 10 years. Overall, more than 50 what titles. Uh, overall, more than 50 titles, more than 600 trademarks. Uh, over 30 patterns, invention patterns, and much more design patterns, and over 50 copyright registrations. And uh, where we could test our IP and how well we work, we have also had quite a lot of lawsuits and arbitration proceedings with regard to patents, trademarks, copyright, domain names, confidential information, like everything you want to see. Uh, one of our so our main patent invention patent relates to battle matchmaking, which is also famous as the great random. And uh, maybe this is why my presentation will be a little bit random. I decided just to cover some different uh, areas of um, the intellectual property questions, something that I would want to know when I started 10 years ago and what I would want to know if I now joined a small developers team or a big developers team or publishing team, anything doing with video games and intellectual property. Intellectual property law in relation to video games is a very complicated matter. There are many aspects, but I would say that my main advice would be very simple. And that would be just focus on what is your core business. Over 10 years at Wargaming, uh, we've been working with creating movies about our video games, books, making huge on-site events where we would invite top celebrities. All this is great, requires a lot of work for intellectual property councils, but you know, at the end of the day, it's not the core of your business. And when you decide how you allocate resources, your human resources, your money, first of all, I would say that we need to sit and advise for ourselves and uh, decide for ourselves what is the core of our business. For us, the core are the games, are the main titles. So there is some homework that you just need to do for your video games. 
And only after that is done, you think about video games, books, and everything else. And the first question on this route is making sure that you own the IP that you think that you own. This requires work on some routine tasks, I would say, sometimes. Checking your employment agreements, checking their policies of con on confidential information that you have within your company, checking that indeed under your agreements with the studios, you as IP owner actually get intellectual property. Your studios can be located in different parts of the world and requirements to how IP is transferred from those countries can be sometimes quite unexpected and you cannot have a one size fit all approach. So on the one hand, it's a little bit routine. On the other hand, it's really something that you need to work very closely on. Another step, which I would say is quite simple, but um, also it required some time for us to understand how important it is, is to educate your employees about intellectual property. You can introduce the best IP audit, hire the best intellectual property councils, both inside and outside. But that post-factum review can never save you from some human mistakes that can appear at the stage of creation of artwork for your game or creation of the code. Just an employee joined your company, a junior developer. He was creating some code in his previous company. He took it here uh, with him at Wargaming, for example. And for us, we don't even know about it. But for us, it actually means that we are using now in our product someone else's IP. And we cannot check it in an easy way. This is something that this developer should know about, his lead should know about. Some artists who get references from Google, yes, they need to understand at least approximately what level, what is reference and what is copy paste of the same image. So yes, these are um, simple advice and I would proceed with them a little bit more. Uh, what I would call uh, getting the low hanging fruits because there are some in the intellectual property field and especially when you're a small developer and you don't have best law firms of the world working for you, I would say that maybe no need to focus on something really complicated like getting as many patents as you want because each patent for an invention to something related to game design in the United States would cost you probably from, from 10 to 40,000, which is a lot. And just to get them to make your portfolio look much better, you need to decide whether it's worth it. But there are things that are not expensive and in my opinion, are definitely worth it. First of them is getting copyright registrations. Again, copyright registra getting copyright registrations in the uh, USPTO is very easy. United States Patents and Trademarks Office. It's easy and it's not expensive. It's $55. And as a result of this not a complicated exercise, you have a um, preliminary evidence that this IP is yours. How you can use it? Of course, you have lots of benefits from having copyright registration. You can sue other companies in the United States. You can get additional damages, uh, statutory damages, but in reality, not many companies go to court. But at least you have this certificate that helps you when, for example, you try to take down a game from an app store, which is your clone. You already have proof that this game <clears throat> is yours. Uh, then I would very much um, rely on trademarks because trademarks is also something not very complicated and at the same time very effective. Most of the infringements that we have managed to take down uh, were thanks to trademarks. 
I mean taken down not as a part of the court proceedings, but at the court of communication with platforms, with registrars of websites, uh, with App Store, Google Play. Uh, copyright is quite difficult sometimes to explain, sometimes to prove. It's a very subtle um, thing. And uh, platforms would be very unlikely to go into details whether indeed there is a copyright violation of your game. But trademarks is something very straightforward. You attach the certificate that this is your trademark. And if your alleged cloner is using um, a trademark similar to yours, a trade name similar to yours, or an icon, it's comparatively easy to remove it from the store. Even if you have it just in a few countries, even if you have it registered in just a few countries, you don't need to go and try to get trademarks in all countries all over the world, yes. You need to probably do it in the, in the European Union, in the United States. I would recommend it doing it also in China uh, because the level of squatting is very high there. And then only if your game becomes very successful, you start thinking about other regions, but we'll discuss it in a bit. And also there is no need to actually go to court against any infringer that you might have. Uh, and it seems to me that um, the simple idea that fighting against a few infringers actually deters others from violations works. We've seen it in the cases about cheaters. And it worked when a company actually starts fighting with cheaters, uh, the level of cheating within uh, the games um, decreases. And we've seen it also with fighting for protection of our intellectual property. So, but those advice are mainly for small companies who are just starting. But I really hope that all of you will become uh, huge companies developing best games, providing us with the most immersive, amazing experience ever. I believe that video game development industry is still a Klondike full of opportunities. Uh, and uh, this is why even while a company is small, and especially when it's already successful, uh, we need to be ready for the wind, as tall trees catch most wind. And um, for this reason, um, I think that it would be good if 10 years ago, we would already have contracts with all friends of um, uh, management of our company signed. Uh, friendship is a great thing, but sometimes uh, when you're already very successful, the demands of your friends can increase as well. Uh, you never know. Be ready for squatting. Uh, why, so World of Tanks was an overnight success, a great overnight success. And uh, within like a few months, while people were just trying to fix the servers, uh, it turned out that we have uh, trademark applications all around the world filed uh, for our trademarks, so for World of Tanks in all classes, and we needed to fight against it very quickly. Uh, so maybe when you already have first success, maybe it's already worth speaking to very, very good trademark attorneys how to better plan your trademark applications. So get proper counsels. It will be uh, helpful not just for um, planning for IP strategy. You'll probably need an IP audit because once you're successful, you're also the main target for all types of copyright trolls and especially patent trolls, which is most painful. Uh, and uh, one small thing, while you're still a small company, if you're, uh, so don't grant perpetual licenses to your products because maybe they will be a huge success and you could negotiate something much better. Yeah. And one more thing is still, like, you know, thinking that I, I had another slide 
about being humble, but is and I still want to come. I don't have the slide, but I still want to comment about it. Probably it was my personal main lesson is however good you are in intellectual property, uh, it's good uh, to stay humble because it's really such a complicated matter, interesting, but complicated uh, that it's not worth to try to invent the wheel. For example, assign, assign copyright um, in, in relation to just two countries of the world. Yes, it's doable under some laws, but it can be very complicated or co-ownership of trademarks in China. So such things are really very difficult. And unless you have just the best advisors in the world, I would not recommend going there. Thank you. virtually stay with us until the end of the panel that would be great that would be the point where we might be having some questions uh, and then without any further ado if i can turn to uh monica monica are you with us and if so the floor is yours i know you were with us you are with us. We see you. And we see your screen and the slide. Great. The floor is yours, Monica. Uh, though you, we don't hear you. OK, do you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we do. Thank, thank, hello again, and thank you for the invitation. I wouldn't be myself if I didn't say that I really appreciate the diversity of the panels today. It's uh, really important, I think, for the industry and for the conferences. Um, my name is Monica Gebel, and I'm a lead AP counsel at People Can Fly, the company based in Warsaw. Um, to say a few words about People Can Fly, um, the, the landmark games um, that were developed by uh, People Can Fly include Painkiller, Bulletstorm, Gears of War, and most recently Outriders. And these are the games which we, we are focusing on for the last, last years. And um, for my work as an IP counsel and an IP counsel in uh, such a company, it is important that we, we operate internationally. So our main office and the place in which I am located as well is in Warsaw. But also we are um, based in, uh, in the UK, in the United States and in Canada. And other than development of games as such, we also do VR, VR, VR sessions and mock-up sessions. So this for a lawyer is... Um, something very interesting to do and work on. And today I wanted to um, to be come back to, to a topic that was um, that was um, discussed a few times, the, the awareness. So um, when I decided about the topic about which I was going to speak today, um, I thought that the awareness about which we were talking and the thing that Gaetano mentioned this morning that third party IP is basically what games are in many cases made of, is um, very important. And, main, and one of parts of my work is IP trainings. And I wanted to focus on showing how such IP trainings and how its aspect may learn, may help developers to ask questions. And um, I think that while many of these questions that I'm going to discuss during my, my talk are normally answered by an outside council or an in-house council as well. The very important thing is to know when to ask such a question. So where such question could be asked, because when designing a game, the developer has to ask many W questions like when the game is going to, going to be located, where, so how the universe of the game is going to look like. And who, so who will be the main character, who will be the NPCs, and how are they going, going to be shown? So today I'm going to talk a, bit, a bit about locations and to ask a first question, real world in a video game. Of course, this is, this is a game which is located by in, in a very, very modern and very up-to-date world, which, which shows many aspects that for sure need to be cleared. And 
the basic thing about representing a real world in a Gizio game is the more it is depicted in a way that is real and representing real people, places and objects or works of art, the greater is the risk of violating third party rights. And the number of laws that protect the assets are visible in the game. And it was already discussed in detail. So just to be quick, um, these are copyrights, industrial property rights, trademark, industrial designs and data protection laws. But and I will, as I will see, uh, as I will show you today, these are also other rights such as property rights, for example, which could be something worth taking into account. So um, a very important thing in game dev is the attentive audience. So the players community around the world, which is able to spot any minor point on any, uh, for example, name on the wall, which is in a very hidden place on a, on a wall when we are playing. And also the serial, serious legal consequences that could be expected in the event of the infringement. So the PR, the PR risk for the game, but also the legal implications for a developer and the publisher. And I wanted to start with a very recent case, which is very interesting and shows that it's not only the, not only the attentive audience, but also attentive right holders, which are shall be taken into account when designing a game. This is a case which was amicably set in February this year. This is the case of a photographer, Judy Jurassic versus Capcom, who developed and published Resident Evil 4, which is here the case. And um, Judy Jurassic is a photographer who made over 800 photos of different surface, surfaces. So for example, door, and as in this case, walls and uh, many other photographers of different surfaces for use for artists, architects, and other entities. And because of the leak which took place at the Capcom, she learned that in Resident Evil, surfaces that looked like her surfaces were uh, published. This, here we have the the um, element of the statement of claims, which was filed by Jurassic in the in the U.S. court, and we see how she spotted the place in the game and the photo. So on the left we see the the game, and on the right we see the photo that Jurassic made and featured in her book Surfaces, and she pointed out all the all the elements of this graphics. So we have this this wall, this wooden wall, and all the elements that were spotted. And what is very important here is that one of her main arguments in this in this dispute was that the places in which she took their photos were very remote and no longer exist. So she insisted that it is really not that possible that the photos here were found by the company itself. And we won't learn how this case would be resolved by a court because it was amicably settled. But for me, as, a, as an IP lawyer, it's really important to point this out as a, an example that textures, because here this is the most important part, that even the textures that seem not, not to be as a major element of the game, but something which is a detail, a background, are also something that is worth really well clearing before using. And copyrights were uh, discussed today in detail also. So just to be quick, what do they protect? Original fixed effects of creativity of individual character. This is a legal definition in Poland and it's of course territorial because rules of copyright differ depending on, on the country. And it's also a tricky part for developers and in game developers to take into account that a license can be subject to different conditions depending on the territory on which it was granted. It is also a wide non-obvious catalog. So songs, images of people, facades and interiors of buildings, signs and logos. Even trademark has its visual parts that can be copyrighted. So not only trademark rights, but also copyrights. In terms of who the owner of the copyrights, it's of course developer to the creative elements that he created, but the third parties, and this is the most crucial part, to the elements they created and which were included in the game. And in terms of duration, as a rule, in, and it is like this in Poland, copyrights last for 70 years from the author's death, for example, the building's architect, and territorially that it could differ. But 
even if we have the copyright clear, we still have to think about some other circumstances that could be taken into account when a potential, potential dispute arises. So here we've got the landmark case, which was mentioned and listed by Gaetano this morning. So this is the case regarding the GTA San Andreas. When the, uh, on the left, we see the screenshot from the game. And on the right, we see the screenshot from the, the, the actual club, the playpen. So to be quick here, the, um, the, the club, um, the club sued, sued the, um, the, the, the publisher of the game against the use of the trademark in this particular case, because we see that it's not the same use. We have the pig pen name in GTA San Andreas and the play pen in the real club. However, the, the club was um, the club was arguing here that it's associated in the game. So the game is using the, the renown also of this trademark. However, in this case, the court ruled that the use of this particular name and the club as it, it, such was um, derivative was derivative and uh, that it was artistically artistically based that the, this name can be used in this particular case so it was favorable for for the publisher and um, the other the other example could be followed 76 when we have this Camden Park and this is a very interesting case because in here there was no dispute in fact it, there is um there is a there is a scene, and um, the West Virginia state, U.S. state, was here very, um, very proud of being being um, featured in the game, and also fans of Fallout go to this place, and this is this this became really a place of cult. Um, when thinking about including buildings and cities in the game, we have to be aware of the fact that architectural designs are copyrighted. And we have this exception, the freedom of panorama, that, that, that the works permanently displayed on public accessible roads, streets and squares or gardens can be, can be used without the special permission from the author, which is a rule. Um, freedom of panorama differs territorially as well, but even on Wikipedia, we, we can do a quick check and confirm it, of course, with a lawyer, how, could, how it could work. And I know that in uh, Serbia, the freedom of panorama works as well and it's pretty broad because it also extends to, to the interiors of the buildings. I'm not a Serbian qualified lawyer, but I was happy to learn that it also works to this broad extent in, in Serbia. As a rule, freedom of panorama does not extend to, to building exterior interiors. Um, it's territorial, as I said, but the attention should be all so the cases in which the we have to pay attention. These are iconic historic buildings. So um, if if we have any type of iconic building, and this could be, for example, the Eiffel Tower mentioned by Gaetano, which could be featured by day, but by, by, by night is protected by copyright. This is the famous case of the Eiffel Tower sliding. New buildings, of course, because the copyrights still still are still in force. And also the national heritage, which could be subject to some limitation. And I wanted to share some, some Polish features here as well. So um, in Poland, we have this specific situation in terms of uh, buildings, and we have additional limitations which are imposed by the owners of the buildings. And in the photos on this slide, you can see the National Stadium in Warsaw, the Palace of Culture in Warsaw, and also the Świętokrzyski Bridge in Warsaw. And these um, monuments and urban buildings are uh, landmarks for Warsaw and they are featured in many many books game games as well as I will show you and other works such as films or for example some videos and the owners of these buildings try to rely on many rights such as trademarks but most of the time they, they rely on the property rights as such to obtain as um, to obtain a license to need them to use them commercially, you need to obtain a special license to use them. So, if you if you ask me, I would say that um, this the use of this will depend on the level of the risk that you are willing to accept. Because from one side, we can say that legally, if we use the, the palace culture of the stadium 
of the or the bridge in the game, we are not using it as a trademark. We are using it as, as a part of the landscape. But if we want to take us re, this this level of low risk here, you can uh, you can sign a special agreement with such a place to be sure that no further action, PR actions, or any other legal re repercussions will be suffered. And Warsaw is, of course, featured in many games. And here we see the screenshot of World War II by Farm 51, when we see how this building, these buildings were featured in a, in a movie in a creative way, in a, in a game in a, in a creative way. And we see the Palace of Culture, which is partially burning. And we also see here the, um, the shopping mall, which is in the center of Warsaw. And this is an interesting example of using the, the logo in a creative way, because normally the, the name of the translated in Polish is um, Yellow Terraces, but here is, uh, it's translated, it's a game of words here actually, it's named Yellow Roads. So basically they are referring to the same place and we know that this place is referred by the logo is changed. And so far we are not publicly aware of any legal actions taken by either Zwote Tarasy or the owners of the Palace of Culture, so the company which is the manager of Palace of Culture, against the use of this game. So this is an interesting example of how it could be used. And then one of the other things that can be used in the game is a map. And if you ask me, are city maps subject to a copyright protection? I would say you, and this is the most common answer of each lawyer, I'm sure, outside council or in-house council, it depends. Because certainly those maps with an original individual character will be works. But we, if we have a simple reproduction of the city plan, the copyright could be disputed. But what I would advise is not to take the such decision to use a map yourself, but always consult a lawyer before including it. And here I use two examples. So the one on the left, as you probably recall, is the Red Dead Redemption 2. And the one on the right is the, the GTA Los Santos map. And this is also an interesting case because this is Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. And here we have the graffiti, which was not disputed as far as I know. But I wanted to... Um, put your attention on the fact that um, copyright owners, but also players are very, very um, attentive in, in this respect. And we've got a Polish game that featured um, some politically incorrect, um, some politically incorrect, uh, I won't say names, but I will say that these are the slogans that are used anti-government and anti-certain publicly known person. And this, this, um, these graffitis were spotted by the players and um, were very controversial because they are, the, the game was subsidized by, uh, by the National Ministry of Culture. So the, using this, this name was widely disputed and the game developer decided to patch the game and delete these names to avoid any potential legal risk or any other organizational risks. And to be honest, in here we have we have this graffiti in the front, which is well, well seen. So imagine that the names in the game that I'm mentioning right now was like in this part of the game. So you have to really pay attention and focus to see the, the names that were featured in the shadows. So this is also an important lesson for an in-house council to always focus on uh, have good relations with developers in terms of raising their awareness about the consequences of using such elements, even if they are well hidden. We, as a lawyers, won't know that. We need to be in communication with our developers and we need to raise awareness that some such circumstances will be and can be spotted by our players, even if internally somebody decides to put its last minute and to hide it from the from the audience from the producers and from the lawyers of course and the last part they wanted to discuss which is also important to raise in an internal ip training is the sources that we can use so the question i get frequently is can i use my in my game stock for example stock photos from a free data database and of course, we have databases like Unsplash, 
for example, this is the terms and conditions of us and splash. This is split screen. This is splash screen of this part. So it depends because each um, each terms and conditions of such a of such a database may be subject to certain conditions. And in here, for example, we have uh, a, the Unsplash grants a commercial license to use certain stock photos. But as they say, they do not uh, such license that they grant does not include the right to use trademarks, logos, brands, people's images, or works of art of authorship. So for example, if we had a photo of a palace of culture, of course, the author of this database can grant the license so we can use it, but still we have to clear the property rights and trademark rights, if any, if we decide to clear them with the owners of the Palace of Culture in this particular example. And this is only one of those because this, there is also public domain, which is um, which, is, you, which can be used, but this is also something that we have to put attention on because public domain rules differ. So ask your lawyer before, before using any documents from public domain. And this applies also to open source, which was mentioned by today. And just ask your lawyer and as a rule, do not include anything be, be, before asking your, after asking your lawyer. So this is something I would really would like to stress out after that and in the end i wanted just to feature a screen from my favorite game which is flower by that game company which is a very relaxing game for a lawyer because there are no buildings and no real life object there's only wind and flowers so we can focus on playing without having these questions whether the developer has cleared out the rights to the elements featured there thank you so much Taras was hosted in a, in a virtual space, and that's actually the place where, because I'm from Orso origin, that's where I do my shopping, and this is the first time I'm going to say it, maybe in the future Metaverse, that's where I'll sh also shop. It's the first time I'm using Metaverse Gatan on the day. <laughs> Thank you so much, Monika, and uh, we, if you can also kindly stay just for the last session, and if I can invite once more Christina to join us, that would be fantastic. Thanks so much. Hello everyone again. Um, I believe there's no need to introduce myself since I don't see any new faces. And of course, hello to the online part of the seminar. Uh, so for, um, for this part, I have um, also thought about what are maybe the best uh, practices in the industry that you can use. So I will try to focus on that mostly. First of all, uh, in order for you to understand my point of view, you need to understand where I work <laughs> because that, that, that has a lot to do with uh, the advices that I'm going to be giving. Uh, Madhead Games is a game development studio and uh, we have been around for the last 10 years. Uh, there has been a lot of excellent games come out of the studio, 66 games to be precise, uh, which we published um, as hidden object uh, games. And now we switched from 2020 to uh, core games and also um, projects that are double A's and hopefully triple A uh, games in the future. Now we are working, we're actually finishing our own game, which I already told you about, Scars Above, which will be published uh, at the beginning of the next year. So feel free to download it once it's out and tell me your, um, your feedback, how did you like it? Uh, we are also working on a big unannounced project and it's actually an IP project. So it's the first one that we got. It's a really big and really famous IP, which I cannot talk about yet, but hopefully we will have again a seminar or something where I will be able to share more details with you. Uh, so what I believe is one of the most important things uh, in a company such as Madhead Games or any other game development company is uh, the software 
uh, assets and license management. Uh, why I believe this is important? Well, any software that is used uh, in the company is potentially a liability for you. So uh, the best way to handle this problem would be to create the procedure and to have somebody who is in charge of following through that procedure and making sure that things are done in the proper way. So uh, in order for this procedure to be successful, you need to address a couple of questions which I put on the slide. So for example, who is in charge to prove every software that you want to buy and use? Why is this important? Well, uh, if you have one person who everybody else in the studio will contact before they buy a license, you are making sure that the right license package will be, uh, will be purchased and that this person will be actually uh, the one who will put it in a, in a general table where you can track your assets and know what is, what is it that you already bought and what is it that you maybe want to buy and, and, and similar. Um, also, in order to, to have this person who is in charge, you, you need to first have a purchase process for, for any software solutions. So before you dedicate this, uh, Person, make sure that every developer knows what should they do when they want to buy something. Uh, even if it's just a picture from uh, a website, or even if it's a, um, I don't know, music clip or anything else, that there is a couple of steps that they should follow through. Also, uh, when it comes to buying any assets or licenses, you need to be sure who is handling the payment and the tax obligations. This is not a small thing to, to talk about. First, uh, the person who is handling the payment is the one who has a credit card on the company's name, of course. So this has to be a dedicated person who you uh, have confidence in. And uh, also a person who can evaluate your tax obligations. Is there a withholding tax to pay? Is there anything else that you should um, apply for or that you should send to your accountant, what are the documents and stuff like that. It's usually not as simple as just buying it online like you shop in your free time. It's, it, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, also, I already said about uh, keeping track of all the softwares that you install in the company. Very, very important. Definitely a good practice that I would encourage. Also, when people have a question like, hey, can I can I buy this or can I use that? First, that they're going to do is check the table and see if it's already been approved, bought, or something like that. If you want to go a step further, you will make uh, another table or a list where you will have approved softwares where somebody who is dedicated to approving what can be bought and used will actually put the data inside. Uh, this is, for example, what, what I do and what we do in the company. So when you want to buy something, you first go and check in the table if it's already approved. That saves a lot of time and a lot of repeated questions, especially when uh, the company is bigger. Uh, also, let's go back to the uh, finance part. And uh, don't get me wrong, I do love legal, but I'm also in charge of the financial part of the company. So I have to uh, actually keep track of these things. So uh, invoices that are paid uh, for the licenses that you bought, very, very important thing. I think all of you probably know this when you purchased uh, your Microsoft package with Word and uh, Excel and stuff. Um, very important to keep track of your invoices because in case of, a, of an audit, this will be a thing that you will show to show your compliance, to show that you are the actual owner of, of the software. This is usually for assets that you buy, uh, that you want to use uh, in your company for the most basic needs, I would say. So this is usually not for pictures from the internet, but it's more like if you want to buy a uh, word and be sure that this is legally how you're going to use it, then you should keep your invoice definitely. Um, and the last but not least, IT security. I have been mentioning this throughout my presentations and I believe it's very important to uh, collaborate with your IT guys. They are a very valuable source and uh, combined with legal, um, they give you actually everything you need. 
So before you implement any big software, especially for finance, accounting, even for legal, I don't think a lot of companies use this still, especially in our region, because we don't really have that, that many contracts that you need contract management system. But let's just stick to finance or, or an accounting software before you buy or use anything that has to do with these um, topics or even absence management. Make sure that your IT checks what are you buying, um, where do they have a backup, are you sure, how are you going to use it, uh, what happens if data gets in any way jeopardized. So I think this is also very, very important uh, for you to consider before, not just buy a software or like buy, I don't know, ClickUp for task management or project management and then realize, oh, it doesn't have a good backup, this is terrible, what if somebody deletes something and then you have a delay in your game development process. So always make sure from the IT side that you're covered. Um, this is as important as it is to legally own the, the asset and the license that, that you have. So this would be like the first part that I think is very important for you to implement as a good practice. As, as, as an industry, in industry standard. So just to make sure you know about your licenses, about your softwares, who bought them, when, where, where is the invoice, did you pay the taxes? So make sure to address these questions with a person who will be in charge of uh, handling this. As for uh, the other part, I will also focus on this, uh, this part where, where I'm going to talk about the assets that you add to your game. Uh, this is as important as the first one is and you will probably see the similarity with my other presentation because this is the exact same uh, way that I divided uh, back then, uh, like here. So uh, this is important for everybody, <laughs> Any, anyone who's doing game development is usually buying assets. Uh, I don't really know. Maybe there are studios who develop everything on their own, but usually you use things that are um, that are just working for you. Why wouldn't you buy, I don't know, a bench or a church scenery if you need to incorporate it in your Unreal Engine? Why wouldn't you, if it will save you time? So this is something that's very relevant. Uh, also, I think one of the best industry standards for this topic is to, of course, have a procedure about it because as you grow bigger, it will become more and more, uh, it will become a bigger trouble to just explain to people what they can and cannot do. But this way, if you have a couple of simple steps, anybody can uh, look at them before they, uh, they want to buy something or they, they say they need something. So, uh, of course, who is in charge to review every license that you wish to buy an asset from. This is very important and I don't believe that you can uh, outsource this because it becomes a question on a daily level when you're uh, developing a game. A game uh, just the game developers just ask, hey, can we use this? Can we buy that? It becomes something that you answer on a weekly basis, probably a couple of times. So. Also, I believe that it's very hard for somebody who is not a legal professional to actually answer these questions because in order to know what you can or cannot use, the person has to read uh, the license agreement. So those, a lot of those boring pages with very little fonts, but it's necessary to be sure that you are buying the right thing. This is crucial before you make any purchase and add it to the game because it's a very expensive, uh, mistake if you make it and you realize after, I don't know, even publishing your game, hey, there is this picture that we were not supposed to use or there is this, I don't know, um, bench or chair or something specific that somebody else designed that's going to um, press charges against you because you invaded their IP. So it's very important for you to uh, know that every license you bought is legitimate, you bought the right thing from the right website. And of course, in a perfect world, you have a game development documentation where you will put everything that you used. 
Uh, what are the steps in the purchase process? Of course, this should be easy. Most of the studios use some kind of project management um, task. They use Jira, they use uh, ClickUp, whatever works for you, but usually everybody is now um, using something. Uh, if it's more than like 10 people. So I don't think this is a problem to have steps, to have just like a smallest purchase process with a couple of steps. Uh, payment and tax obligation, in my opinion, should be the same person like the one from the last slide. So this is probably the same person who's reviewing your license, at least at the beginning, uh, because the same questions apply as to the last one. Are you, um, do you have to pay taxes? Do you need to send a tax residency certificate? and similar, so this is something that uh, this person will be very familiar with since he or she will be doing it every day. Um, the Who documents the game development process and all the assets? This is something that um, it's kind of harder to implement, I think, but as soon as you start, the easier it will be. Uh, everybody now has project management teams and project managers involved in uh, the process of making a video game. So I believe they are the best people to have um, game development documentation where they will keep track of everything or almost everything that which was uh, included in the game. Uh, why is this also important? Because sometimes it helps you keep track if there are credits that you need to address at the end or the beginning of your game. So when you are done with everything, you will make a final page or the first page or whatever where you will list credits. And if you're using Unreal Engine or uh, other um, licenses or softwares, you will probably have some legal obligations to at least uh, list them on your, on your credits page. So this will be very helpful for you. And this is something that I would say is like the highest industry standard to be, to be completely sure that you have uh, game development documentation. This is something that's very, very safe legally when anybody comes to you with a claim saying, hey, this drawing from your game is, this is something I drew through two years ago and you just downloaded it from the internet. Well, if you can look in your, into your game development documentation and say, hey, no, this is not true. This was developed in-house by our studio. And of course you can find this through email search or through your project management system, which you will be able to do, then you are fine. These are the, the, the small steps that I would say will save you from a lot of uh, potential harm uh, in court or just having to settle, just stay out of it with a couple of, of simple steps. So I uh, wouldn't take much of your time. I think I've covered the two most important things that, um, that are the standards in the, in, the, in the industry when it comes to um, game development. I think you should always have these, this clear uh, divide in your, in your mind when you're thinking about your game, what you can and cannot do regarding IP, regarding software solutions, assets, uh, and um, everything else. And also uh, a clear understanding of what you cannot and cannot do in your company and what are some procedures that you should uh, definitely have in place and who is handling all of this for you. So um, thank you for, for your time. Thanks so much, Christina. And uh, let's have a quick round of questions. Uh, from my side, uh, I hope Daria and Monika are still with us. So from my side, uh, since we have so high profile, important IP councils internally in these great uh, um, companies, uh, when do you think a gaming studio should get an in-house council? What is the best moment for that? I'll start with Christina. Okay. Well, since I have been the advocate of having the person who is uh, dedicated to this, I would say as early as possible or when you as the founder uh, or the founders or the top management realizes that the workload is just becoming bigger and bigger and that you don't have 
time in your day to read license agreements or to decide if they can be downloaded and bought or if that's too much. So I would say when you realize that it's becoming overwhelming that you should, um, thank you, <laughs> that you should um, hire an inside legal counsel. Or at least if you're not able to, if that's too much of an expense, at least a person who you are confident that will do their best to um, analyze the situation, do the everyday job, and uh, ask a lawyer if they need one. Thanks, Daria. I agree with Christina, the earlier the better. Yeah, uh, if, uh, but maybe it's not necessary that this is a specifically intellectual property council. You just need to have at least a lawyer who will be respect, uh, responsible for all legal issues. And it does not necessarily need to be something very experienced in the area. Just someone who will feel personal responsibility for what's going on in the company from legal perspective and the main point of contact. Monica? I would agree with Daria and, and Christina that personal liability for, for what's happening in the company is very important. I also think that the advantage that an in-house lawyer has is the whole picture of what's happening in the organization. So the possibility to take into account various factors which are not sent to the outside counsel because this is just how it naturally goes. So. As in, uh, for the last 11 years, I've been an outside counsel. So what I missed frequently was many detailed aspects of the process about which I am adv advising to, to my clients. So I think that having inside counsel allows organization to function more efficiently because of not only IP, an IP lawyer, but a general counsel as such to, um, to focus on what's happening in the company and help processes to be more efficient. That's what I think. For everyone, perhaps, uh, what would be, if you can say, share, what is the most common question you get on IP inside a gaming company? Like something that constantly comes up. Daria? So, at least a few years ago, we were always um, getting questions about some myths that I don't know where it came from. Like, uh, if we use something for 15 seconds, 15 seconds of someone's uh, track, it's, uh, uh, it's okay. Or if you take something from the internet, it's okay. So I think that the most bothering and frequent questions are about this myth, about people who just want to do something. They Google, they find a reply that suits their needs and then come to you uh, to hear your reaction. Yeah, this is <laughs> what I would consider most popular. I would agree with Daria that there is uh, that certain knowledge that we know lawyers are not aware about because the free licenses or like short usage, like for 30, 30 seconds, five seconds, or a part of an image, or for example, a free commercial license, are very confusing for non lawyers. So I think that many questions are due to the fact that uh, some assets, for example, seem to be seem to be available commercially available, but also publicly available. So, so they're construed as be included in public domain, for example, and can be and can be used. So I think this is something that many questions come to me about. Thanks so much, Christina. Yes, well, definitely uh, the most common questions are about licenses. Uh, can we use something from another website? And now we have a, incorporated this into a procedure, so it's very elegant. People already tick a couple of boxes, so one of the most important ones 
is are you going to use it in the video game? Are you going to use it internally? Is it just an asset? So for me, that's very important to know before I can answer uh, the question. And just to link uh, li uh, the, the website or the license agreement that they wish me to check. I think this is the most common. This is what I was uh, telling you about when you are making the game and uh, the process is ongoing. You really get a lot of these questions, uh, even on a daily basis, but definitely on a weekly basis, which is definitely a time when you should have a dedicated person to answer. Thanks so much. Uh, now let's move to see if there are any questions perhaps from the floor. Yes, please, if we can get the microphone. One, two? Okay, there we go. Thank you. So question for Christina again. Um, uh, pursuant to your previous lecture, uh, you mentioned, uh, you've been mentioning NDAs and how IPs adhere to NDAs. So I actually wonder if you've ever had an op um, opportunity, if you ever had a situation uh, in which you had to handle an NDA breach that was in connection with a certain IP. For example, someone posted something they shouldn't have done. Uh, and how did it go? Very interesting, uh, very interesting question. Uh, yes, I have. Um, I actually had a couple of cases uh, like that. They just depend on the, you know, how serious the breach was or how far did it go? Was it just that somebody said something that they shouldn't? Was it that they shared materials that they shouldn't and stuff like that? Yeah. The tricky part is when this happens with somebody who is, for example, your ex-employee or somebody who is leaving the company but doesn't return a USB or you're not sure if they downloaded something or similar. So it's always tricky when it comes with a person who you don't really have the best relationship or even you do, but since they quit the company, you're never sure how they're going to react. So these would be the most tricky parts, and I would always try to um, to resolve this in a friendly way to just see what the problem was. Was this person aware of the breach? Uh, of course, depending if the breach was smaller or not. That, that's what I mean. To just be sure that, to see well, what actually caused it, and if, if it's repairable, if you can say, hey, please return the USB. If you forgot to do it, you need to you know, give back all your equipment once you quit, or if they said to somebody and like we heard about it and we would have to remind the person, hey, you have, um, you have obligations towards your NDA. I have um, not been in a situation that we had to contact a lawyer about this. Um, I guess we would if the situation be became severe and we had uh, at least one uh, legal basis that we could call the lawyer. That would be the employment contract and the, uh, the the secret that you have to keep while you're employed, or the NDAs that sometimes we we have signed with employees, which are specific projects or specific cases. But my advice would be if you are giving somebody specific access to something, and this is also something that I've done. So, for example. Sometimes this is your system administrator. Sometimes it's somebody who has access to accounts, which are very, very important. Uh, get this person to sign an NDA with a clause, uh, which has a monetary uh, fee in case they breach it. So this is what right. my advice would be. So in that way, in case they breach it, you will have a legally binding document and uh, an amount of money that you will be able to go to your lawyer and say, this guy breached, I have evidence, so evidence. I can send it to you, just, you know, file a claim or just whatever. Uh, I think this is the best way because having NDAs which don't have any uh, contractual obligations which involve money usually don't put the same pressure on people as these ones do. Right. And do, do you think that um, the term of the NDA greater than five years is reasonable? No, I don't think so. Uh, two years is reasonable after they terminate the employment. You can go up to five, but I do not think that it 
that in front of any court or any competent authority you would be able to explain why it was five years and what is right. its longer period. Maybe mm -hmm. if you have a game or an IP which will be um, published in, for example, four years or something, mm -hmm. or you know, further notice, then maybe yes, that it could be reasonable to say this is the specific case why I, right. I put, but not to put five years as a general clause. I right. I would recommend it. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Thanks so much. And now I let's turn to the online audience and I'm turning to you, Anastasia, if there are any questions. Yes. Hello again, everyone. We actually have one question each. So one for Daria and one for Monica. I will put the first one up, which is, if I'm not mistaken, for Daria. So the question is, how to best protect a brand online with the wider geographical coverage. So, so I think we're going back to trademarks plus. <laughs> yes, uh, it's a very important question. And uh, as Monica uh, has said, uh, standard legal answer, it depends. It depends on what kind of brand it is, on how big it is, and on how much money you are ready to invest into it. So you need to decide. So there is no such thing as worldwide trademark registration, unfortunately. You need to apply in specific countries. Uh, obviously, it's in most cases, it's much more beneficial to make extension of your trademark through viper procedure, actually through Madrid protocol. Um, and um, but the decision on, in, on the list of countries where you are going to register is something that you need to work on with your business development team and with your marketing team. With your business development team, for example, you check whether there will be any merchandise, whether you need to cover any classes uh, besides uh, the main classes of 9 and 41. With regard to marketing and publishing departments, you need to understand from them what are actually your main markets. So maybe you just get all your revenue from the United States. So then you get registered in the United States and in the European Union and China, as I have said. Uh, but if they are really targeting main countries, you it would be reasonable to go registered in all those countries. And again, nobody gets registration everywhere. You just need to, um, even for protection of your brand online, it's enough to refer to just one trademark certificate that you have in one country. And most probably platforms already will take down uh, the game which is using your trademark. So, depends. Thanks, Daria. And uh, maybe then the, for the next question, Anastasia. So the next question, as I already <laughs> foreshadowed, is for uh, Monica. And uh, I think it is the second example based on the example that you had in your presentation with Playpen versus Big Pen. Big, Big Pen. And uh, so the question would be, under USA law, something that was protected by First Amendment, how would it be argued um, that there is no infringement under EU or Polish law? So thank you, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you for this very interesting question. So obviously there is no such a transformative use test as in the US law, in Polish law. And I think that this is a complex question which will also depend on uh, legal basis which be, would be invoked by a potential um, complainant here. So um, I would think that um, first of all, this even if we want to rely on the trademark protection, the name is not used in the function of the trademark. So this name is rooted as is what the trust is not the trademark, it's just a part of the landscape. So I would think about the um, the freedom of panorama in Poland, for example, protects protects publicly available spaces and the elements which were fixed for fi permanently fixed in the in this public space. So I will probably think about this. I will also th think about this um, modification, which is made, which I think, by the way, is, is very is very is very nice in terms of um, 
keeping the name and transforming it in, in nicely. But and also I will think about the um, potential benefits for the owner of the building and for the trademark holder because this World War Two, World War Three, sorry, game is uh, is a work of art and uh, work of culture that makes this area even more popular. So. This is just the free argument that I would make, but still, it depends on the legal basis of the other side, but also on the complex circumstances that could be in this case. Thanks so much, uh, Monika and uh, Daria, since you're the only one missing in this panel, favorite game of all time. Sorry. What's your favorite game of all time? You're the only one missing in this panel without the reply. Huh. Um, I would say Monument Valley. Another relaxing and beautiful game. I love this game as well. Actually, I actually totally agree with Daria. I like it so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much again to, to all the panelists and for, for joining us today. And of course, we look forward to future opportunities to work with all of you.